those. Um, I'm going to introduce myself as people trickle in. Please make yourselves comfortable. Join us. So hello, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for this evening. Please don't mind me as I look at my phone. I'm not very good at memorizing scripts. <laughs> um, so for those of you in FE 1100, by the way, because some of you are joining here for some class credit, which I appreciate, uh, stay around till the end of the meeting. I'll have the QR code put up on the screen for you to scan in then. Um, but firstly, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Nari Lachis. I am a first year grad student in the nurse department. I graduated from here with my nuclear engineering uh, undergrad degree in May, and I'm our current president of the American Nuclear Society. So for those of you who may not know, this week is a national ongoing event called Nuclear Science Week. Um, it's a nationwide effort to spread awareness and educate people about the various sectors of our industry. Nuclear is not one of those things that most people have the privilege about thinking about every day. So uh, we do our best to make information more accessible to others. And that's something I'm very passionate about. So we do a lot of education events, things like that on campus. Um, so for some of you on campus students, you might've seen our table outside of Havener. Uh, well, not Havener, the library, I'm so sorry. Um, and we've been hosting a few other events throughout the week and we will continue doing so both tomorrow and on Friday. So for anybody interested in going on a tour of our own nuclear reactor on campus, please find me after the meeting. I'd be more than happy to sign you up. That goes for any member of the public, not just students on campus. Um, so <clears throat> without much further ado, I'd like to invite our department chair for the NERS department, that's Nuclear Engineering and Radiation Science, Dr. Nuker, to introduce our speaker for the evening. Thank you, Nari. Hi, Katie. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. It's quite an honor that she agreed to uh, uh, talk to us. And uh, thanks to Nari and the rest of the team with the NS student chapter who has made this possible. And uh, I know that Dr. Huff really loves student chapters. So uh, I was pretty sure she would say yes if she could make it happen. And I'm so glad that she did. But uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Dr. Huff is the Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Energy with the Department of Energy. So that's a very high position, uh, second under uh, Dr. Granholm. And, uh, you know, it's a great honor for her to, to speak, but just to tell you a little bit about her before uh, she took the current position, she was a professor at the University of Illinois in their nuclear engineering department, which is the, uh, let's see, the nuclear plasma and radiological engineering. I think we have a better name than they do. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and she was in the uh, leading the advanced reactors and fuel cycles research group. And uh, prior to uh, that appointment, she was a postdoc at Berkeley. Uh, she had several assignments out there at UCAL Berkeley. Her uh, home bachelor's was University of Chicago, PhD from Wisconsin, in the north, one of our sister um, departments, uh, where she worked on modeling and simulation of advanced nuclear reactors and, and fuel cycles. So, I don't know if everybody agrees with me, but we're in a sort of an exciting time in nuclear energy where uh, the public, uh, the, the politicians, and uh, the needs of industry are all aligning that nuclear is, uh, is going to be an important player in the future. And Dr. Huff has the responsibility of leading the, the nation's programs for this, um, this, what I sometimes call renaissance, maybe that's an unfair term, but still. It is a, a good time to be in the field that we're in. And so, you know, I'm really excited uh, to, for the opportunity to leave through there. And I want to hear more from Dr. Huff on some of the things that she uh, touches on and for the Department of Energy. So without taking any more of her time, because she didn't come here to hear me, uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Huff. Thank you so much, Professor Newkirk, and thank you, uh, everyone. I especially really do love ANS student sections, as noted. I, you know, I was the ANS student section faculty advisor at the University of Illinois during my professorship there. In fact, I know a, a few folks came, at, you know, in the years that I was there from ms &T, you know, to come and visit our student section periodically, and uh, we were always really thrilled to meet you. So maybe I've met some of you before. Um, you're all very small, so who knows? Uh, I can, you're, you're small on my screen, but I, I do see you very clearly. Um, 
I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of what the Office of Nuclear Energy is doing, but uh, you know, I uh, I know you all are probably tracking what we're doing pretty closely because, as Professor Newkirk indicated, there is a lot of attention on nuclear right now. The American public, the Congress, the President, the Secretary, myself, industry, ANS, everybody is really going full speed ahead. Um, in a very, in a really historic way. Uh, we have a lot of opportunity to take advantage of this moment, this moment of bipartisan support and bicameral support. And um, we can't let it go past us. There are many, many potential pitfalls before us that will require your um, constant attention over the course of your coming careers. Uh, and so I'll try to touch on those a little bit. But everything the Office of Nuclear Energy does tries to mitigate the potential for those pitfalls for the possibility that nuclear energy can be, you know, one of the key components of our climate solution. There's no question that we need to get there in terms of climate. So uh, without further ado, I will just sort of give you a brief overview. I intend to talk for about 35 to 40 minutes about what the Office of Nuclear Energy is doing. And then I know that a lot of you have really like great questions. And so I wanna make sure there's just plenty of time for that discussion. Um, so start thinking, like get a pen out and like a notepad or something. Think about what questions you wanna ask um, because I really would like to hear from you and your questions. All right, I'm sharing my screen. Hopefully you can see it. I have faith that you can. Um, I think you all know, and perhaps you don't, but so I'll say it again, or, or I'll say it. Um, nuclear power is our single largest source of carbon-free electricity in the United States. It's currently about 47% of U.S. clean power production and about 18% of total U.S. electricity generation. That's in the gigawatt hours, not in the gigawatts, right? So beware. This is sort of... Um, Suggestion number one from me is that beware when you hear public officials and others, you know, folks from other parts of industry talking about capacity, that a uh, gigawatt is not a gigawatt, but a gigawatt hour, that's a gigawatt hour. So keep that in mind. Um, currently, it supports about 475,000 nuclear en energy sector related jobs. There's one small modular reactor design certification approved by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. That's the new scale Voyager, um, 55 megawatt reactor. And there's one reactor remaining under construction. That's Vogel Unit 4. Um, so it's a really, you know, just if you've got nothing in, you know, nothing else from this talk, this is the state of nuclear energy in the United States. And you should be able to pull these facts out of your pocket. If you can't remember these specific details, it's pretty straightforward to say we're the largest single source of clean carbon-free electricity in the United States. We are about half of that carbon-free electricity. We have about 20% of the current generation in the United States for electricity. It's hundreds of thousands of jobs and there are real reactors coming into play. Those are the things you should take away. All right, um, here's another way to look at this. And if you're interested in comparisons between other clean energy sources, this pie chart is a really helpful one. Geothermal is really small. It's unfortunate because there's a lot of potential for new geothermal and it's definitely an attention uh, that we're paying in, in DOE. We have a geothermal earth shot associated with some goals that we have for the geothermal sector uh, to see that percentage grow and really take advantage of the geothermal resources in the US. Solar power generates about 9% of our electricity, hydropower about 16%, wind power about 27%. Both wind and solar are growing. Uh, we do want to see geothermal grow. Hydro may not have much more capacity to grow. And there are a number of dams that, you know, frankly, are under uh, some uh, reconsideration in terms of their continued operations, in part because of their uh, historic relationship to the rivers and water waterways where they currently sit. And so, um, just keep in mind that that hydro number is less likely to go up than it is to go down, but we're watching it pretty closely because it's a critical component of our clean energy generation. Um, my office, got to follow the money. Before you say what you're doing, you got to say how you're doing it. And we do it through U.S. tax dollars. I work for, as was said, 
Jennifer Granholm, Secretary of Energy. She leads the entire Department of Energy, including the National Nuclear Security Administration. She, you know, Jill Ruby is the direct is the administrator of that, but reports also to the secretary. Secretary leads everything under the whole set of uh, applied energy offices, the Office of Science, the uh, whole set of de demonstration offices and the new infrastructure sub office that includes Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations and the Grid Deployment Office and the Grid Modernization Office and a whole, whole fleet of excellent new offices that we've seen created by the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. I lead a tiny little part of it I mean, it's not so tiny. I'm one of sort of what they would call the big six in terms of the size of the budget. Uh, and NSA is vastly larger than any other office, but um, NE, the Fossil Energy Office, the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office, the Office of Electricity, the Office of Science, we all kind of share the biggest sort of set of the remaining pie. And our budget is about $1.773 billion this year. That's our annual budget this year. You can see from FY20 to FY23, these are fiscal years, uh, our budget has monotonically increased. And we've gone from a $1.5 billion budget to an almost $1.8 billion budget over the last few years. That growth is not just with inflation. This is a growth and change in administration to administration priorities, bipartisan priorities. I mean, this started in the previous administration in 2020, but has continued reliably with this administration. Um, in addition, this year and, and late part of last year to that annual appropriations set, we have a number of key nuclear equities in the laws that the Biden-Harris administration have successfully passed with Congress. Uh, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, also known as the IIJA, um, the includes $8 billion for regional hydrogen hubs. It says at least 25% nuclear. What it actually says is at least four hubs need to be announced and at least one of them needs to be nuclear. What we just saw this week is the release of the hydrogen hubs that were announced. Um, we have a number of hydrogen hubs that are out there and uh, three of them involve nuclear. Um, so we're really excited. It's higher than 25%, I'll be honest. So I'm really pleased. Um, we'll update the slide now that we've got it out there. Um, and what that is, is a demonstration of the necessary requirement that we build out a lot more hydrogen production capacity to allow for more energy storage across our grid um, and to decarbonize some of those really hard to decarbonize sectors. $6 billion in civil nuclear credits to keep the existing plants online, even if they face some economic challenges, um, and $2.5 billion to forward pay the committed dollars for the federal cost share for the two advanced reactor demonstrations that started in my office, the X-Energy XC100 project, which is being built in Sea Drift, Texas, and the TerraPower natrium reactor that's being built out in Wyoming. Those projects were born in my office, but with the bipartisan infrastructure law, we're given more certainty of funding with this $2.5 billion for the coming years, and we're moved into the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, which is overseeing a whole fleet of real commercial demonstrations of new clean energy technology. The Inflation Reduction Act also included hundreds of millions of dollars for high assay, low energy uranium. We'll talk about that in some detail later in the deck, so I'll leave that there. Uh, it includes a bunch of tax credits, including a $15 per megawatt hour production tax credit for clean energy, uh, including nuclear, a 30% investment tax credit uh, associated with new nuclear, and $150 million directly to our national laboratory Idaho National Laboratory. While nuclear energy work happens at many national laboratories, Idaho National Laboratory is the national laboratory that my office oversees. So that's our nuclear energy flagship laboratory in the United States. My office oversees the contract with Mattel that runs that laboratory. Um, office of Science it has that relationship with most of the national laboratories. NNSA has that relationship with the weapons labs and uh, FECM and uh, uh, the Office of uh, and EERE have relationships with NETL and NREL um, in a similar fashion. Um, what, are we, what are we trying to do? Our mission, we wanna advance nuclear energy science and technology so that we can meet the kinds of needs that the US has in the energy, environmental and economic space. It's pretty straightforward. Our priorities are therefore similarly straightforward. There's only four of them. One, keep the reactors that are running continuing to run. Uh, 
we, the worst way to win a foot race, where you should be running forward is to begin by walking backward. And that's what we've been doing over the last decade with uh, nuclear technology. You know, we've allowed the economic constraints on our grids to drive economic challenges where nuclear was facing off against really cheap, unmitigated fossil fuels, particularly natural gas. And those economic challenges forced a number of reactors to close right in the moment when we should have been building more nuclear reactors, which brings us to our second priority, build new reactors. Uh, pretty straightforward. We're doing everything we can, whether it's research and development, cooperation with communities, um, giving technical assistance to Congress and engaging with universities and the national laboratories, as well as industry to build new reactors. We're doing everything we can. On both the front and the back end of the fuel cycle, we need to secure and sustain the way we manage the process of you know, mining, milling, converting, enriching, fabricating, and then storing and managing and processing and potentially disposing of uranium. Uh, so securing that front end of the fuel cycle and sustaining the back end are critical components of our key priorities. And finally, perhaps most importantly, over the course of the last year and a half, we want to expand international nuclear energy cooperation. I'll talk in some detail about what that looks like um, sort of geopolitically, but I think it's critical to say that what we've learned over the last year and a half um, is that energy can be and will be used as a weapon by our adversaries. Uh, it'll be used to bludgeon innocent civilians. Um, and this cannot stand. Energy security is national security. And nuclear energy is a really reliable source of secure energy. And a lot of nations are seeing that now, and it presents an opportunity for trillions of dollars worth of investment in new nuclear in the near term. All right, so now we're gonna, so I've told you what I'm gonna tell you. And now I'm gonna tell you, and then eventually I'll remind you what I told you um, as all lectures go. So I said, we wanna keep existing plants open. How the heck do we do it? Uh, we do a number of things to keep existing plants open. Not only are we supportive of like the civil nuclear credit program that I described, et cetera, but we also conduct at the labs with universities, et cetera, research and development programs that enhance performance, extend lifetimes, reduce operating costs, and develop advanced fuels. Extending performance and, and lifetimes includes things like operations and maintenance advancements that the national laboratories can help, you know, de-risk for industry, um, or that partnerships grant funded by DOE can help industry figure out for themselves. Advanced fuels can help reduce operating costs as well. And so we are pursuing a number of advanced fuel types and that the existing fleet can use. And finally, we're looking at ways not just to reduce their costs, but to increase their revenues. One way to increase your revenue um, is to think about new products that you can make. In a universe of hydrogen economies, we're looking really closely at hydrogen production. Yes, this week, the president announced these hydrogen hubs, um, and that includes a number of new nuclear projects that'll produce hydrogen. But for some time, the Office of Nuclear Energy, in partnership with the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office, has been funding small pilot-scale demonstrations that you can indeed produce hydrogen at a nuclear power plant. The regulatory questions that a person might have on like, is it okay to have an electrolyzer and a hydrogen storage tank and things of this nature on a nuclear reactor site? Um, the questions a person might have about connecting the thermal energy and the electrical energy towards a high temperature electrolyzer. These are being fleshed out and tested through in three demonstration projects um, that I'll talk about in a second, uh, two slides from now. And so we're already producing hydrogen. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, by expanding these applications and markets for nuclear energy, whether it's hydrogen or direct combined heat and power um, or the direct support, for example, of a data center, um, thinking really hard about what more profitable use of that energy um, could be leveraged towards the increase in revenues for these plants is a critical component of what we do in our integrated energy systems research. Um, okay, so... I said the Lightwater Reactor Sustainability Program does R&D in all these ways to improve operations and maintenance costs to reduce the costs of running a reactor. Um, this includes a number of things around sort of 
um, using risk-informed systems analysis and security and in order to help with, for example, reducing the physical security overhead where it's not necessary. Um, conducting materials research to reduce the uh, frequency with which maintenance is required by reducing the um, uncertainty in materials engineering uh, responses to aging and use. Flexible plant operation and generation kind of touches on some of those uh, additional applications, but also touches on what it looks like to do a little bit more load following. You know, we don't do it in the U.S. as much as they do in France, but actually in France, they do a great deal of load following with very similar fuel and reactors. Um, and so exploration of how to more flexibly run and operate nuclear power plants in the U.S. that are already running and have historically just run, you know, at 100 percent all the time you know, reevaluating whether it makes more sense occasionally to load follow a little bit. Uh, we're trying to help with that. Um, we uh, at Limerick Generating Station are working with the utility and the plant owners to uh, digitize the um, instrumentation and control system. One of the excellent cybersecurity features of a nuclear power plant is that there's nothing in it that cybersecurity can attack because it's a, you know, there's a one foot air barrier between the control system and everything else. And the analog safety systems means it's really hard to digitally interfere. But one of the downsides of all of that analog stuff is that the, uh, the supply chain for some of the components like little diodes and lights and all of the widgets that you see on a standard um, nuclear power plant control panel, they have producers, you know, um, and those producers are no longer producing those little lights and widgets. And so it can be extremely hard to replace some of the components on those control panels and um, instrumentation uh, panels. Because of that, you can save money potentially if we were to digitize most of the control panels in the fleet, but someone has to go first. One of the plants has to do the work of engaging with the NRC and working on a new design and getting a new design um, process handled and like installing a new completely digital anal um, safety and control system. So demonstrating that digital INC interim staff guidance approach to these licensing upgrades is a project that we're conducting with Limerick and we should be finished installing these new digital safety systems in the Limerick generating station uh, in 2025 or 2026. So, well, it's actually both. So one unit will get it in 2025 and one unit gets in 2026. Uh, this is really important because after that, the utility is really interested in converting lots of plants, but they do need one of the plants to go first and like run through the NRC process as an example for everybody else. So DOE is a partner in that, by largely funding it and guiding it and working with the NRC. I mentioned the pilot hydrogen demonstration projects, Constellation leads at nine mile point, a low temperature electrolysis demonstration that produced hydrogen this year on site. Um, Nine Mile Point uses that hydrogen at the site in the plant because hydrogen is actually a chemical that we routinely like purchase and bring on site and use in the operations of nuclear power plants. Um, Energy Harbor and XL Energy are uh, slated to produce hydrogen at their sites in, next year. And in the case of Excel at Prairie Island, I'm extremely excited to say the unique heat generating quality of nuclear power will be leveraged toward a higher efficiency hydrogen production strategy called high temperature electrolysis, which is exactly what it sounds like. Instead of just using electricity, you use electricity and you boost it with a direct source of heat in order to get better energy return on investment as you produce hydrogen. I mentioned accident tolerant fuels. We are producing a number of accident tolerant fuels with new clads and coatings that can be used in future, in existing reactors in the future to increase burnups and longevity and just imp improve operations cost in general. Uh, we have a number of these partners. A lot of them are getting close to commercial readiness really soon. Okay. That was the like, how do we keep existing reactors running? That was that was priority one. We're now on to priority two. Building new reactors. I think most of you know that there are a variety. There's a menagerie, myriad nuclear reactor vendors promising all kinds of different sizes and shapes of reactors. They are micro reactors. There are small modular reactors. There are large scale reactors. They have different coolants and fuels and they have different temperature outputs and they have different applications. Um, I think the critical component is that in our vision, 
we see an important role for nuclear in providing clean firm power at all sizes, whether it's gigawatt scale plants like Vogel, whether it's small modular reactors that could directly replace, you know, retiring and retired fossil site coal plants in particular, um, or micro reactors that could substitute for what we currently rely on, for example, diesel generators to do, to provide direct dedicated tens of megawatt scale power to critical infrastructure like hospitals and residential campuses and that sort of thing. Um, we're really interested in seeing small communities, especially in remote and austere environments, say Alaska, using micro reactors where they need reliable power, but the sun doesn't always shine. Um, micro reactors, small modular reactors, large scale reactors, we have a variety of vendors that we're supporting. Um, but a number of them are interested in advancing not just the reactors, but also the fuels. Um, within our sort of desire to build new reactors, we also have to enable a bunch of supply chains. A critical supply chain that the Department of Energy has supported for decades is tristructuralized tropic fuels. Um, advanced fuels like this are being planned for a number of the reactors across a range of sizes, whether it's the X Energy XC100 reactor, the Kairos Power Hermes reactor, USNC's micromodular reactor, or lots of others. Largely in the very high temperature space and the micro reactor space, we see these tristructuralized tropic fuels being used. And that relies on decades of DOE research in developing and qualifying this fuel with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. If DOE had not dedicated time and energy and attention in developing this stuff with academics and universities with partners across the entire nuclear community, we would not be in a place where the Nuclear Regulatory Commission could point at, could say, you know, this is a qualified fuel that can be used in new reactors. And we're there now. That's a real difference between now and 10 years ago, so that there's a new advanced fuel that can be used. Um, X Energy is building a fuel fabrication facility out in Tennessee. USNC has a pilot scale fuel fabrication facility out in Tennessee. It's a really exciting time for TRISOs. Okay, I mentioned replacing coal plants. I think most of you kind of heard the message there. But the idea is lots of coal plants need to retire, but the grid itself relies on that firm power, the availability of power in that location associated with those high voltage power lines at the couple of hundred megawatt scale. Dewey issued a report last year that indicates specifically that we identified 157 retired coal plant sites and 237 operating coal plant sites as potential candidates for new small modular reactor scale reactors. Of these sites, 80% are good candidates to host advanced reactors smaller than the gigawatt scale. This is huge, right? Um, it's something equivalent to about 250 gigawatts worth of grid capacity that would be leveraged in this context. So you don't have to build new power lines. The communities are there and not leaving people behind in this transition to cleaner energy is a critical component of the Biden-Harris administration's plan for mitigating the worst impacts of climate change. There are extremely skilled people operating these coal plants. There are steam turbines at coal plants. There are boilers and there's electro electrical grid stuff just like at a nuclear power plant. There's often cooling water. There's a number of welding activities and turbine and maintenance activities. There are boilers. It is a number of the kinds of skills, boiler makers and welders and electricians, et cetera, that run nuclear power plants are already running coal plants in the locations where we think you could build new nuclear reactors. So you could bring those people along, those sort of skilled union jobs. And so, you know, a critical component of our desire is to see nuclear replace coal where renewables wouldn't work. It's small footprints, it's high voltage power lines that expects firm power. Nuclear can provide that where a lot of other clean energy alternatives might not be able to. So really excited about that option. But there are a number of advanced reactor types that we support. We have a variety of different funding and cooperation mechanisms. Um, we support light water small modular reactors and high temperature gas reactors and molten salt reactors, both Molten salt reactors that use a clean salt and solid fuel, but also molten salt reactors that use liquid fuel, uh, liquid metal react cooled reactors, heat pipe reactors. There's a whole variety. Um, and we have projects with companies in every single one of these different sort of reactor families. Um, it's 
I think many of you already know there are a lot of benefits to advanced reactors. I think if you if you walk away with nothing else, it's that you know over the course of the last many decades, running you know the world's largest nuclear fleet, American nuclear energy engineers and scientists have learned a lot. Uh, we've learned about more passive safety approaches, reducing the number of moving parts required in an incident, um, and we have an opportunity to incorporate that in these new designs, and that's what's been done here. Um, the intent is for, to make them more affordable by reducing their size um, and making them, you know, building them more like airplanes than airports. But ultimately, we're really in a place where we need the versatility to decarbonize the entire grid, and nuclear can have that. So that's where we're at with this. We have a number of private par public private partnerships. I mentioned a few of them. New Scale has a project, the Carbon Free Power Project. Um, where they're starting their first Voyager small modular reactor build under DOE cost share. They also just announced that they're working with other uh, entities in Pennsylvania and Ohio on new sites. So they don't even have just one site. They're thinking about a number of projects. Um, this is good because frankly, like not all of the projects on this slide are going to succeed. So I want to see lots of shots on goal. Let me put it that way. I'm not really a sports person, but I understand that means take a shot and then take another shot. And then maybe one of those two is going to go in. Um, there's microreactors, VWXT banner, Holtec SMR160, the McCree reactor, the Kairos KPFHR. All of these are risk reduction awardees. The top half of this slide are projects that my office oversees through the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program and the Carbon Free Power Project. The bottom half of the slide are the two projects that I said moved from my office to the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations. That's the TerraPower Natrium Reactor, Sodium Cooled Fast Reactor, and the X Energy XE100 Gaseous High Temperature Gas Reactor. Um, I just talked a little bit about the Carbon Free Power Project, but here are some details. I think, you know, if you take away nothing else, it's a six pack of small modular reactors. Um, they're 77 megawatts piece, and the idea is to build them out. First, the first attempt will be out in Idaho, and the first module is planned to start operation in 2029. Uh, the two um, demonstration awards, if you will, are dedicated for Kemmerer, Wyoming, where the natrium reactor is replacing a retiring coal plant. And the X Energy XE100, where Dow Chemical, a chemical company, is partnering with X Energy to use that heat, that very high temperature heat. I think you know all of this, but I'll just say here's the other rest of the menagerie I just mentioned of the risk reduction awardees. We're reducing risk through 80 20 partnerships with these companies. Um, and actually, you know, I do want to just note something. People forget about universities. I never forget, right? The new scale reactor, it was born at Oregon State. This idea did not come out of private sector thoughts and research. This came out of a university, a nuclear engineering program. The Kairos PBFHR, this fluoride salt cooled high temperature reactor, that came out of the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, under Per Peterson, and New Scale is now a publicly traded company. Kairos has multiple locations where they're building, uh, you know, non-nuclear prototypes and soon a nuclear prototype. Um, university ideas through DOE funding, starting with our Nuclear Energy University program, but moving on into laboratory cooperation and direct demonstration award partnerships with private entities. Universities can create ideas that spin off into reality, and this is proof. Okay. Serious note over, back to the regularly scheduled program. Uh, there are a number of universities actually involved in all of these awards, but Massachusetts Institute of Technology is one of the leads on, um, on a high temperature gas reactor concept. But there are a number of other concepts that we're supporting through the advanced reactor demonstration program that are a little further from uh, completion. And we, of course, support uh, Lots of other small awards through our technology commercialization fund, our small business research fund, the Nuclear Energy University program, direct cooperation agreements called CRADAs between the national laboratories and companies. We support lots and lots of reactors. These are just sort of our highlight kind of 11. And here's a variety of reactors that we're predicting for the coming decade. Uh, Marvel, you know, this 2023 number is probably uh, a little delayed, but the Marvel micro reactor is being built out at Idaho under DOE authorization. Um, the Pele reactor is being built for DOD. This is a micro reactor using triso fuel. 
the McCree reactor. We just we're just releasing the um, finding of no significant impact on the McCree reactor. We're building this. Um, it's a reactor experiment out in Idaho to test uh, Southern Company and Terra Power's theory on the Terra Power molten chloride reactor, a fast reactor. Um, and so we're going to run uh, an experiment out in Idaho to prototype some of the reactor physics. The Hermes Kairos reactor, it's a micro reactor. I just described it. This is the one from Berkeley. Uh, Draco, we're going to get into DOD space reactors. Uh, Terra Power, the UAMPS reactor. Ielsen Air Force Base in Alaska is targeting a pilot demonstration in 2027. This is perhaps Oklo. X Energy XC100, also 2027, etc. So a pretty exciting decade. All right. I know I'm getting short on time and I want to talk about the fuel cycle. So I'm going to move quickly through the fuel cycle. I said we were going to secure and sustain it. I think you all know that we use a lot of uranium in the United States. We have the largest nuclear reactor fleet in the world and they all use 5% ish enriched uranium in their rods. It comes to about 2,000 metric tons a year of enriched uranium that we need. It's 40.5 million pounds of like raw uranium. That is not all produced in the United States. In fact, only a small percentage of it is. Um, and 95% of the uranium delivered to U.S. utilities was of foreign origin. Not all, this is not necessarily bad. We actually have great hybridization of the raw uranium distribution in the U.S. in the world. Canada, for example, is a huge supplier of raw uranium and a tight ally of the United States. So importing uranium from them is not somehow bad. Ultimately, however, there are some components of our supply chain after the raw uranium mining that present a challenge. As you may know, one mines raw uranium, and that's the previous slide. But then one has to convert it into a gas, uranium hexafluoride. Then you enrich that gas, um, and then you can deconvert it into an oxide and fabricate it into a, into a fuel rod, and then you can put it in a reactor, right? Right now, we see the supply chain for the mining component for raw uranium and the fabrication component as very low risk. We have a lot of options for the supply chains for these two components of the fuel cycle. The fuel supply components associated with conversion and enrichment services are at high risk, um, not just for high assay low enriched uranium, but for the low enriched uranium we use in our reactor fleet every single day. I said we need 2,000 metric tons of enriched uranium, 20% of that enriched uranium currently comes from Russia. Russia is the largest supplier of enrichment and conversion services in the world. And we in the United States don't currently have the enrichment capacity to replace Russia's capability. While we have some limits on uh, American imports of Russian material, uh, we need to both invest in new enrichment capacity and uh, work towards increased import restrictions on uh, Russian um, enriched uranium products. Uh, this is because it's not a trustworthy source and we really do need to secure the supply chain to ensure the continued operation of our plants. Um, in good news, we have expanded enrichment capacity for the first time in decades here in the United States. Uh, we are producing high assay, low enriched uranium in Piketon, Ohio as of last week. I got to go physically stand next to it. Um, I pressed a little button along with Deputy Secretary Turk, uh, and those piked in cascades started up. They're humming beautifully and producing HALU right this second. They will eventually reach 900 kilograms of HALU per year. Um, starting next year, they will produce 20 kilograms of HALU by the end of this calendar year, possibly more. So we're really excited about that. But we need more. Um, there are a number of different ways we're getting HALU, not just from, and HALU is necessary, by the way, High assay low enriched uranium is necessary in part for the advanced reactor fleet that uh, non light water advanced reactors like sodium cool fast reactors and X energy, energy XC100 and a whole fleet of others will require HALU to, re to reduce, to increase the compactness of the reactor cores. The, this is HALU is just low enriched uranium between 5 and 20%. Um, uh, most of these are targeting 19%, but it depends on the reactor. We've established a consortium of potential customers for this material, um, and we're planning to um, produce limited amounts through a number of other DOE-owned assets. We have some high enriched uranium that we can downblend to the right amount, and that we're doing that, and that's the picture here. Uh, we're doing that out in Idaho. We're recovering uranium from, for example, research reactor fuel 
um, and making it available for this program. Uh, using multiple pathways, you know, really digging in the couch cushions as this Halo market stands up is really critical um, because we have a real need now, but not a full commercial market yet. And so the government is like very hands on right now with establishing both, you know, making sure that the demand is clear and the supply options are clear for high assay low energy uranium. So uh, in addition to securing this nuclear fuel cycle, we are also working to sustain it. Our spent nuclear fuel management office is revamping our overall integrated waste management strategy uh, and implementing a consent-based approach for siting federal interim federal consolidated interim storage facilities. I understand uh, you all in Missouri Science and Tech are actually one of the 13 awardees of our big national consortium competition. We released $26 million to the U.S. to reach the informed part of informed consent as we have a conversation with this country about how we're going to identify a location to consolidate the spent nuclear fuel in locations across the country to one or more uh, consolidated interim storage facilities, uh, reducing the burden on communities that never ask to be the storage facilities in the long term. Uh, I'm really excited to say, you know, I, I think that the consortia that you all are leading and all the other uh, the consortium that you all are leading and all the other consortia on the list are going to play a really critical role in our view of how we can get to a volunteer or possibly many volunteers of locations and communities that are interested in taking on that responsibility for the nation. In addition to all that, we do R&D on spent nuclear fuel in a variety of ways. We have research and development on high burn-up fuel storage and management. We have research and development on developing high-tech rail cars to transport this fuel. We have real rail cars that we've made and are testing and things of this nature. And we would really like to integrate spent fuel management into our international approach. Um, when we talk to countries about exporting nuclear fuel, um, some of those countries don't currently have a plan for spent nuclear fuel. They don't even necessarily have a nuclear regulator. And so we help them with a number of these components when we interact with them. But making sure that we're sharing ideas that we have about how to manage spent nuclear fuel and learning from countries that are ahead of us, like Finland, um, is a key part of our work. Um, I mentioned consent-based siting, the idea here, and you can go to energy.gov slash consent-based siting to learn more about it, but I understand you all probably more, know more about it than any university department in the country right now. Uh, so, you know, connect with your faculty on this topic. But DOE is really committed to a consent-based process for siting one of these, and the intent is to really center equity and environmental justice at the heart of this process, uh, which I think will be a more durable approach. Uh, here's the rail cars I talked about. We actually physically built these rail cars, um, and there's there's a 12 axle rail car and an eight axle rail car and a buffer rail car and an escort vehicle that like uh, bookends the rail cars. It's very cool. Um, I said we we're testing high burn up fuel. That at North Anna we're we're testing um, what happens with higher burn ups. You know, are the casks sufficient? Do we need to do anything in particular to safely store and manage high burn up fuel? And it looks like pretty positive right now when we have a plan, but that this is a critically important project for industry. All right, I promised I would talk about geopolitics, but I also promised I wouldn't talk forever. So for three minutes, I'll talk to you about geopolitics and then I'll end and open it up for questions. So if you haven't been writing down your questions, please do it because I'm going to come to you for questions in three minutes. All right, T minus three minutes. Our international situation is very serious. Here's a series of pictures of me and the secretary meeting with various people, with John Kerry, et cetera. I'm, I visit a lot of nuclear facilities across the world. I engage directly with my counterparts and others um, in lots of nuclear and potentially nuclear nations. In the United States, we have a number of advanced nuclear companies. We have a number of standard nuclear companies like Westinghouse or GE, right? GE Hitachi, who want to export American nuclear technology to other nations. Most other nations running nuclear power programs have some state-sponsored element to their utilities, right? So the governments that our companies need to interact with often need to see an American government counterpart advocating on behalf of those companies when they enter into these export conversations. Um, not only is there export control under the National Nuclear Security Administration, 
but our competitors like Russia and China come to a country and they say, you know, we'll finance it for you. Uh, we will train your workers. In fact, we'll send our own workers. We will help your regulator, like, you know, follow our licensing approach and you'll have a license. Um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll co-own the plant with you because now we finance it. American approach is different. We don't try to own energy infrastructure in other nations. And that's, that has to do with our view of national sovereignty. Uh, our view that other nations deserve sovereignty over their own energy infrastructure. Uh, but there are ways the U.S. government can help with our Export-Import Bank and the Development Finance Corporation. We can help with loans that can help countries finance nuclear reactors. With our expertise, the U.S. government can coordinate on knowledge sharing that can support the development of a nuclear industry or the expansion of a nuclear industry and workforce um, in a new nation. Um, but ultimately, what it comes down to is the excellence of American technologies and the availability of those technologies. So we're in a really good spot um, to have conversations and to really drive forth what we see as a potentially, you know, almost two trillion dollar market, possibly more, um, as the world attempts to meet the growing challenge of climate change. We expect that nuclear will have to double or possibly triple, and our assessment is triple across the globe in order to meet all of the promises that nations across the planet have made at the International Panel for Climate Change Conference and things of this nature. Uh, in order to triple nuclear power, the United States will need to export a lot of nuclear technology in support of our allies, and it will help solidify confidence in the geopolitical regime. Pax Americana, if you will, is underpinned by the 100-year relationships that we can establish through nuclear energy cooperation, whether it's selling a reactor or just supporting new builds with some of our construction firms, or even providing, for example, Westinghouse is able to provide fuel for Russian reactors currently situated in nations that no longer have diplomatic relations with Russia. The VVR-1000s and VVR-440s across Central and Eastern Europe need a particular kind of Russian designed VVR 1000 or VVR 440 fuel and Westinghouse, an American company, stepped up. And well, the component of Westinghouse that is American stepped up and developed that fuel, made it available actually in part in cooperation with DOE um, starting years and years ago. And now that fuel is available and they're making contracts with uh, those Central and Eastern European nations and helping them get away from Russia. So uh, the geopolitics matters. Um, the designs matter and American excellence in nuclear matters. So with that, um, oh, I just said all of those things. We do a whole bunch of things. And I was going to say something about our cross-cutting priorities. Um, but I think this is generic across DOE. You should know that across DOE, across, in fact, the administration, we're trying to improve diversity in nuclear, in, in all of our work and in my office, therefore, nuclear energy. We're trying to advance environmental and energy justice. And you heard that in the context of consent based siting. And all of that is associated too with prosperity of the American workforce. So there you go. Thank you. And I didn't touch at all on our university program, but um, if anyone has questions about that, I can talk at length about NEUP, about scholarships, fellowships, et cetera. So over to you. Questions? Let's give her a big round of applause, right? <laughs> Oh, I see the gray hat. So you talked a little bit about increasing the profitability of reactors, but it's still, in my opinion, kind of hard to get a utility company to build a reactor. So how do we kind of move from the R and D to the construction phase of a lot of these reactors without subsidies on mass? Yeah, so there are a couple of things. So it starts with subsidies, right? These like cost shared public private partnerships can reduce the risk by building out the first of a kind. But the second, third, fourth, fifth of a kind, they need to be on private industry and like a real customers need to volunteer. Those customers are slightly more likely to volunteer in relation to um, today than they were two years ago because of some of the investment tax credits from the Inflation Reduction Act, including add-ons. Like if you produce hydrogen, you can make hydrogen and get an extra three bucks a megawatt hour if, with your clean nuclear energy that's already getting 15 bucks a megawatt hour, right? But we're not seeing them all raise their hands at once. Um, we would really like to see more of that. We see some companies really in the lead, TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, 
does seem to be sort of a front runner with their announcements associated with the GE BWRX 300, but they're letting Canada build it first. <laughs> um, so what do we do? Well, there's a lot of interest right now from those companies and utilities and potential customers in something called cost overrun insurance. And so we are working with them to help them under help folks understand an idea of what it looks like to share risk across the first five or 10 builds so that a number of different customers can together say, we want to be in the first 10, sign us up, and then they collectively share cost overruns which is the real fear. It's not the actual cost of the reactor, but the potential that it goes over budget as you're building it. Um, share the cost overruns for the one or two that might have overruns because over the course of building nine or 10, you will stop having cost overruns, um, but nine or 10 people have to sign up to be customers. And so the idea here is get those nine or 10 customers to sign up together. So we are working with companies with ideas about what that financial instrument could look like. The loan programs office has a number of loans that can support guaranteed financing. Um, Jigger Shaw has a quarter trillion dollars worth of loan authority right now and would really love to give it away to nuclear, um, but he, he does need those applications and they'll come in if there's a little bit more certainty in cost overruns. Research and development on project management would probably help, uh, <laughs> frankly. All right. Um... Do you happen to have a favorite uh, reactor design type? I'm sure it's like illegal for me to have a favorite, but of course I have favorite reactors. So I will admit that when I was a postdoc, I did work in Pear Peterson's group on the on the Kairos PBFHR before it was called the Kairos PBFHR when it was just a mere NEUP IRP award. Um, and so I have a particular fondness for that reactor. Uh, my research group at Illinois did a lot of research and development, research and modeling simulation on liquid fueled molten salt reactors of various types, largely because I saw a gap in our modeling and simulation capability for those reactors, not necessarily because they're my favorites, but of course, famili familiarity uh, breeds fondness. And so I do have some fondness for uh, liquid fueled molten salt reactors and a small part of me hopes for their eventual success, but I have I would not bet on them tomorrow. Um, I my favorite reactor will be the one that's built first. Here it's a wrong thing. I can go and look at the supply chain and Midwest, Illinois, Missouri, Indiana, Ohio used to be very strong in, in fabrication. But that has eroded over the last three decades or so. And many of those have the, uh, what I call dormant capability, but not active. DOE and the, and the agency, are you looking at somehow reviving that capability? Yeah, you know, so the Inflation Reduction Act has some very clever production tax credits for manufacturing. So if you're a manufacturing company and you're producing components or gadgets or widgets or what have you, if you're doing like forging and end stamping, for example, for small and medium scale nuclear reactor components, and they contribute to clean energy applications, you could be eligible for the 48C Clean Energy Manufacturing Tax Credit, which the IRS recently released some guidance on. And the first round of applications is in now, I think. I'm not sure when the results will be out, but there will be multiple rounds of applications to take advantage of that tax credit. It is limited, like it doesn't go to an infinite number of dollars, but there are billions of dollars in that manufacturing tax credit. And I think you know the real key is making sure that nuclear reactor vendors know their supply chains well enough today to alert potential future suppliers that they could get tax credits to invest in the expansion and manufacturing capability of nuclear components. And while we're seeing a little of that, I would love to see more. So get the word out. It's really nerdy. 48C IRS tax credit like guidance for man clean energy manufacturing. That's what we're doing. <laughs> Um, which country would you say is making the biggest strides to bring nuclear power to the forefront of like, power generation right now? China is building reactors faster than anyone else. Um, if you want to think about it in sort of ter terms of like just gigawatts of expansion. If you want to think about it in terms of geopolitical leadership, I think I think we're doing well. 
in the United States, raising to the forefront the critical nature of building new nuclear if we're going to fight the worst impacts of climate change. I think our president is an excellent advocate on the world stage for this, especially our secretary is an excellent advocate on the world stage for this, and I do my very best to support them. I think we have some real allies in nations like Poland. It's like a newbie to the nuclear universe, but recently signed with Westinghouse uh, a deal to produce, you know, three new AP-1000s in Poland, a nation that has never had an operating like gigawatt scale nuclear power plant. They have a, a little research reactor, Maria, named after, of course, Maria Slodowska Curie. Um, it's an adorable reactor and they do a great job with it, but they've never had a civil nuclear sector. And so they're really like jumping in, like face first. And I'm really proud of Poland as an ally. You might be too far away for me to have heard you exactly. Could someone repeat the question? Leah, would you please speak up? Uh, with the unanticipated cost of building the bottle plants, uh, do you see that like, affecting the prospects of building more large scale reactors in the US? The unexpected cost overruns of the new nuclear plants, will it will it be a black eye that causes us to not build new nuclear plants in the gigawatt scale? Was that what you said? Yeah, essentially, uh, what's the prospects looking like to build full-scale nuclear power plants just because of how bad those overruns were? Ah, gotcha. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, that's a great question. I would really like to see more AP-1000s built. We now have demonstrated a supply chain for that reactor. We have seen Westinghouse work with Southern Company to build it. The loan programs office dedicated for quite some time U.S. taxpayer dollars to ensure that those builds finished. Uh, I think we're much happier that they finished, even though they went over budget and over schedule, than we would be if we had never started. But it takes customers with a gut that see the possibility that the next one will not go over cost and that it's a it's a hard pill to swallow for utilities and in particular like really large scale utilities that run pretty tight margins that have a lot of regulation around their like um, cost structures and operate usually with quarterly meetings of their board that demand a profit um this can be very challenging for a utility company or a prospective reactor owner and i think there is a chance, um, and I expect, I'm an optimist. I think someone might raise their hand and say, yeah, we also want an AP-1000. There are a number of locations where there's already sort of site characterization and approval from the NRC to build new gigawatt scale reactors from when I was in graduate school. Um, <laughs> I It's possible that those sites will be considered but I expect it to happen at sites where existing units are already present. If gigawatt scale is to be built again at all, it'll be adjacent to other gigawatts of nuclear. I believe uh, something that awareness is really important in commercialization of the reactors, especially in the next generation reactors. So uh, I'm not hearing you very well. So could you like come really close? I believe that uh, nope, share... you're just gonna have to walk up. I really can't hear from back there. I'm so sorry. Plus, I get to see your face, whoever you are. You're no longer four pixels wide. Thank you. See, yeah, you're cool. So I, I believe that, that uh, public awareness is really important in commercializing the next generation reactors. So, what are all some of the strategies that uh, are in plan for this uh, public awareness, and how how soon we can see a commercial reactor? I mean high temperature or the next generation reactor in operation. Yeah, so a number of these new builds are targeting the end of this decade. So that's something you can kind of put in your pocket, but also like AP-1000, that's, a, that's, a, that's what I consider an advanced reactor. You can, you can cut off power to that reactor for 72 hours and, a, and no human needs to lift a single finger for 72 hours, no impacts to the reactor, no safety concerns at all for 72 hours. Um, that's an advanced reactor, my my friends. Okay. Um, so advanced reactors are being built. 
one was just built in Georgia. Another one will turn on very soon. The next set will come at the end of the decade in the sort of 2029, 2030, 2032 period. In terms of public awareness, I do everything I can. I talk and 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 talk. But our communications team does a ton. We work directly with um, various non-governmental organizations to help spread the word and provide key technical data to you know boost things. You'll find just yesterday, Jigger Shaw, who leads the loan programs office, talked to Kai Rizdal on his Make Me Smart podcast about nuclear. You know, a half an hour of me talking to their staff, you know, before that meeting meant that they were already smart on nuclear and then they could ask Jigger how to get the economics to work. Um, I It's Nuclear Science Week. And so you'll see on our social media a lot of attention on, uh, you know, fast facts. Um, here's three fast facts about nuclear power. Here's, you know, three advanced reactor facts, like et cetera, et cetera. You'll see little videos. We're really moving into the kind of social media that's related to videos. But I think we're doing really well on public, public awareness. We're tracking through a number of polls. The increase in acceptance and appreciation of nuclear bipartisanship is high. Um, the Advanced Nuclear Fuel, the Nuclear Fuel Avail Security Act recently passed the Senate 96 to 3. 96 to 3. Do you think the Senate has agreed on anything? 96 to 3 recently? The answer is no, they have not. <laughs> this is something they care about together. Really, honestly, there are very few bipartisan issues in energy right now. Very few. And nuclear is one of them. We do not have the full public support. So, for example, there was an interesting study about whether you want a nuclear reactor in your backyard. And it was basically like a poll. And they asked specifically that question. And less than half of Americans actually want a nuclear reactor like in their community. But it's a higher number than we've had in the past. But it's lower than like, say, wind turbines, which are above 50 <laughs> percent. OK, so we still have a lot of work to do. I think it looks like a lot of social media, a lot of talking, a lot of me talking, a lot of you talking, you going to elementary schools, me being on Twitter, talking to world leaders, talking on, you know, Zoom calls with people, making little videos where I talk about fast facts, writing blog posts about all the work we do. Um, but it's going to take every tool we have, I think. But it has been working. We're getting there. You could wear cool nuclear science week earrings just to like <laughs> signal your enthusiasm. I think we have time for one more question. Dr. Lazier, go ahead. Okay, so then I have to sound like if you said what is boy, so I'll just stop right in the middle here. Thank you. Okay, so I think I'm no longer disembodied. <laughs> You're right in frame. Okay, yeah, I'm right in frame. Good, Good to see you. Good to see you too. But my question has to do with, with things that affect customer. Is what is DOE's position on uh, I would say pushing or encouraging standardization? Of things like maybe couplings, fittings, pipelines, uh, even vessels, like things that would make manufacturing of various reactive types a lot easier because you have something that is standardized and you can put stuff in. Think electrical things if you wanted to buy something, you can go to a pipe and say, I want three more pipe, I want this, I want that. So, what, what is is there a position that DOE is taking and uh, what do you think of it? If it's not, what are the challenges that come with that? So I think I'm understanding your question correctly, but I might, I might not be. I missed a couple of words. So um, uh, <laughs> would you like me to summarize, Dr. Yeah, Lyons? could you please summarize the question? <laughs> I think Dr. Lyons is asking um, if there's anything the DOE is doing to encourage standardization of components of parts uh, in reactors so that you know we can drive costs down, make things okay, a little okay. bit. So sorry. I get it. I get it. Okay, okay, okay. So, um, Standardization of codes and standards, like codes and standards work does happen in like supported by our nuclear energy like reactor office currently led by Deputy Assistant Secretary Capaniti. Um, it happens really slowly and by committee across, you know, a whole variety of stakeholders. But DOE often does have a voice, especially in the setting of codes and standards, but standardizing what like components and whatnot the industry uses is perhaps a bridge too far for our capitalist society. So the thing that we tend to do in the United States is incentivize with carrots. It's very challenging to incentivize any kind of industry movement, especially just private sector nuclear energy, but really any kind of industry movement anywhere in the US with like a regulation with a stick, right? 
or by by sort of like stating aloud some specific like demand. Uh, think back to Jimmy Carter's like wear a wear a sweater. Um, there was a moment Jimmy Carter wanted people to conserve energy, encouraged Americans to lower the temperature of their heating in the winter and put on a sweater when they're at home. And the man is an absolute American hero. And people still remember how much everyone hated the suggestion that they wear a sweater in their own home. Um, it's unfair, but it's a very independent minded American position that like, you will not tell me what to do. But what we can do is help with codes and standards around materials. And so we do do that. We work directly with codes and standard setting agencies with the American Nuclear Society and others, the American Mechanical Society of Mechanical Engineers to identify materials, standards, et cetera. And we develop new things that are so attractive that industry wants them. Triso fuels are a good example and accident tolerant fuels are a good example, but like pipes and fittings and whatnot, they are like, maybe I'll like bridge too far because we start to sort of get in the way of industry choices about their designs. It's a good idea. I mean, but I, I suspect that if we were to get in the business, what we would probably end up doing is working with companies to create like the best mousetrap so that everyone wants to buy that particular kind of mousetrap like we have with Triso Fuels, um, rather than saying like, you you know, this is the only allowable mousetrap because we're not a regulating agency either. So, yeah. Well, if everybody would give her one more round of applause. Thanks for staying late. I really appreciate it. I know it's like dinner time there. It was nice talking to you all. And um, yeah, thanks for having me and good luck with everything. Thanks so much for being here, Dr. Huff, and giving us your time. Have a great rest of your week. Yeah, you too.